Good morning. Morning, everybody. You know, it's really cool to stand up here and, and see you guys all fellowship and as we prepare for, for worship. So um, that's, that's really great. It's really, really neat to see. Wow, it's a beautiful morning out there. Beautiful fall morning. Um, welcome, everyone who's here. Welcome, everyone who is worshiping with us online. We're really glad you could join us this morning. Um, if you're visiting for the first time, we have uh, a purple welcome bag in the back of the, the sanctuary there for you. And in that bag and in the pocket in the pew in front of you will be a connect card. So if you're new here, you want to fill one of those out, we'd love to, to connect with you. Um, so you can fill that out and put it in the offering, one of the offering boxes that's outside the, the doors of the sanctuary there. Less than a week away to the gathering at our place in Elizabethtown. Everyone's invited. If you didn't sign up, and later this week it works out for you to come, please don't come, or please come even if you didn't sign up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with 160 hot dogs if nobody shows up. <laughs> but anyhow, everybody's invited. Like I said, if you didn't, we'd like you to sign up so we have an idea how much food to buy, but... If you didn't and, and you want to come, you're more than welcome to. Um, we'll get started around 6 o'clock. Um, we'll have hot dogs, rolls. We'll have some grilled or you can cook them on the campfire. Um, Donna's mac and cheese, which is real yummy. Um, assorted chips and snacks. You can make your own s'mores. We'll have water to drink. Uh, if you want something different, you're welcome to bring that. And then we'll have all the paper plates and plasticware and all that stuff too. Um, we'll do hay rides. Actually, there'll be straw rides in the back of my pickup truck. And Bob Rushke is going to be bringing his guitar, I understand, for a sing-along. Uh, you can bring a lawn chair or a bag chair to sit, sit by the fire. Um, we'll have the big church canopy set up with tables and chairs as well. Um, that'll be lit. And as of now, forecast is like 50-50 for rain, so hopefully... Uh, you know, God will work a miracle for us, and it won't rain, and we can, we can uh, get together. But um, there are a few of you who didn't include phone numbers, and we'll, we're going to track you down and get them, because that's the way that we will let you know if we're going to have to postpone. Um, we do have a rain date of the 14th. Um, so, like I said, if, if we can't go Saturday, it'll, it'll be a week later. And finally, GPS, some GPS apps won't get you to our place. So out on the bulletin board, I, I put some little uh, sheets there, little pieces of paper that have the, the directions to our place where you can track Donna or I down and, and we, can, uh, we can help you out with that. Um, we'll be starting the men's breakfast up again this, for the fall. Uh, that'll be October 21st at 8 a.m. There's a sign-up sheet out on the bulletin board. Um, there's also a COG sign-up sheet uh, for the next gathering there on the bulletin board. The Mount Joy Community Fall Fest is coming up on Friday, October 27th from 5 to 8. We've begun collecting candy donations to be handed out to the kids that night. And we can only accept individually wrapped candy to, to hand out and unfortunately no homemade stuff. So it's all got to be prepackaged. Um, like the small bars or, you know, stuff like that. The, uh, there will be a bin in the lobby to, to accept those donations. All Joy Kid volunteers, there will be a meeting after Sunday school and the congregational meeting on Sunday, October 22nd. Um, lunch will be provided for all volunteers. I don't know, you might get more volunteers. If you feed them, they will come, right? Okay. Um, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Let's pray. Good morning, Lord. It's good to be in your house this morning. And uh, wow, Lord, what a beautiful morning. We, uh, Don and I were in the western part of the state yesterday, and the leaves are changing, and it's just so beautiful when you uh, bring out your fall paintbrush and share that beauty with us. Um, thanks for the recent rain, the sunshine. Thanks for all the things that you put around us to remind us that, that you're God, you're you're our creator and our sustainer. Nothing surprises you. Nothing happens without 
being planned by you. Um, Bob's devotion this morning talked about wisdom and revelation and wisdom and revelation from, from you, from your spirit to reveal to us how awesome you are and how we cannot comprehend the love that you have for us. Lord, I pray the, your blessing on each one this morning uh, who's here. Uh, be with those up here at front who are sharing. We pray for, um, for Pastor Dick as he brings your word to us. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds to what you have to share with us. It's in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to stand up and join me in worship this morning, we're starting with what Bob calls a musical sandwich. So we've got Holy is the Lord into Echo Holy. I guess it would be a breakfast sandwich, right? All right. <laughs> The joy of the Lord is our strength.
Father, we stand in awe that you have given us such amazing songs with such amazing words. But they're our songs, and those are our words, Father, because we're excited about what Jesus does in our lives. Sometimes, Father, we don't understand you. Sometimes we have to just rest in knowing that you are in control. But we're so grateful, Father, that all of this is because Jesus does change our lives. You have given us eternal life. You have given us something that we can't earn on our own. So search our hearts this morning and see that we're filled with gratitude and thankfulness that Jesus has paid the price for our sins and that through faith we can come into your presence with confidence knowing that we are your children and that you love us and bless us. Father, you've blessed us so richly individually. You've blessed us as a congregation. And we're so excited, Father, all that you're doing in our lives and in the lives of the church here at the Mount Joy Church of God. So as we present our offerings, uh, whether they're vocal or whether they're monetary, we pray that you will give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, how to invest that money, how to use that money, how to invest our lives, Father, in those around us so that we could bring you honor and glory. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you, and thank you for the privilege that you hear our prayers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and the Joy Kids, uh, ages 8 through 12, are dismissed.
speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. like to read from Revelation 2 verse 17 which kind of goes along with the next hymn that we're going to sing it says whoever has ears let them hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who is victorious I will give some of the hidden manna I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it known only to the one who receives it now we're going to sing brethren we have met to worship
continue our series today, Seven Words to the Church for Today. And uh, last week, many of you stood and said that you would at least pray and ask that the Holy Spirit would lead you to someone to share the good news of Jesus Christ with. So I wanted to see if anybody had a testimony this morning of somebody that maybe you had the opportunity to share Christ with this week. And you will share that with us. Anybody? Had an opportunity this week to do that? Come on down front so the people who are watching online can see. So I didn't actually watch Pastor Sermon last week. I was working, but I'm glad that you said something because... I work at Mount Gretna Psychiatric Hospital, and I was surprised to see how many people actually enjoyed talking with the chaplains and enjoyed reading the Bible. And I had the opportunity to sit down with one person. Um, He was very negative, hated life, hated what was going on in his life, going through divorce after being with his wife for many, many years. She just, I guess, one day up and decided she didn't want it anymore. And... After he talked with the chaplain, he admitted that he was starting to believe in God. And it was amazing to talk with him because as me individually, I don't try to force my beliefs on others. I let them come to me and I just, I felt very blessed and like God was just, with me that day and helping me find the words to speak to him and help him realize that, you know, while he may be feeling horrible with his situation right now, God has better for him. So. Amen. Thank you, Heidi. Try not to get emotional. (laughs) Sometimes I think sharing Jesus has to do with serving. And uh, uh, I work at a subacute. This is too emotional. Anyway, um, a lady came to me and didn't have shoes. And gave her shoes. And I was kneeling at her feet. What are your shoes And she was so thankful to have a new pair of shoes. She had one shoe, and it was falling apart. And so Cindy and I went and bought shoes for her, and I was kneeling at her feet, putting her shoes on. And that was sharing Jesus. Amen. Amen. All glory and praise to God. I'm a praying grandmother. I pray for my grandchildren as long as well with my children. I had the opportunity to talk to two of my grandchildren that I don't normally see. They were in visiting. And I spoke to my grandson and I said to him, how do you feel about God now? Because he's an agnostic. And he said, well, I am still don't believe, but he said, if my children want to go to church, I'll let them go. I said, okay. Uh, I said, you know, I pray for you every day. And then I spoke to his uh, significant other. And I didn't know where she was spiritually at all, but she absolutely knows nothing about God or Jesus. My heart was broken when she told me that. Um, so, but I, I spoke to each one individually and prayed with each one and was able to give them a couple of tracks and daily bread, that type of thing. And I told them, just read so you can learn about who Jesus is and 
and who God is. I said, and if you need, need to, just text me because they're gone out of my life again. I only had them for one week. So they're, they're gone now, but I'm not going to stop praying for them. They need to be saved. We all need salvation. We don't want to be in that bad place when Christ raptures the church. We want to go up to heaven. And I want all my family there and my church family. We just got to love our people and keep praying for them. Amen. Don and I were traveling this weekend. We were in Butler, PA, home of the World War II Jeep, the original Jeep. <laughs> we're having dinner at this place, and um, the, there were four, two couples at the table next to us. And we overheard part of their conversation. It was of a political bent, which I won't go into, but we were in agreement. So the one lady got up to go to the restroom, and... Um, I, I said something just to start a conversation about, hey, we didn't mean to eavesdrop, but we, we've, we hear what you're saying. Um, that turned into probably, what, a 20-minute conversation um, that ended with, with us praying with the lady. And we didn't really share the gospel, but we, I think we shared the love of Jesus with her. And, and it was, uh, <laughs> when Don and I walked out of there, we were like, Yes. <laughs> so, anyhow, it was a really cool experience. God made it all happen, so it was really cool. Amen. Anyone else? This is, I think, your third week here, right? Yeah, it feels yeah. good, too. Amen. This is James Harris. Well, on our uh, Friday, I okay, called my uncle, and I told my uncle I had started back coming to church. And he said, you done started back? I said, yeah, man. I said, feel good. And he said, well, he said, one thing I want you to do, he said, you don't have but two uncles on your dad's side. He said, you get a chance. Come and see us. I said, well, I said, I'm trying to get closer in church now. I said, I don't have nothing else better to do but get closer in church. And on Friday... Me and the pastor was talking, and it was the things that my uncle and the pastor was talking to me about. I never felt this way before because it was other churches I went to. They made me feel bad. I mean, bad, bad, bad. But at this church, when I, come, I feel like I'm at home, which I'm originally from South Carolina, graduated from Team China back in 2006. And my uncle, well, I don't, like I said, he ain't doing too good, but time when I told him about I was going back to church. It made me feel like I was I was blessed by telling him that I was going coming back to church, where most of the other people who I was telling about I was going back to coming back to church. They just looked at me like I was crazy. So, <laughs> long as the good long as the good Lord blessed me to put ten toes on the floor, I'm blessed and I'm always coming to church. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for sharing this morning. Um, I really appreciate those who took seriously, and I would ask you to continue to pray. Uh, God, open up opportunities for me to be able to uh, share. Um, I have a, a guy that waits on me in the mornings. His name is Owen, and this week I took an opportunity to share the gospel with him and uh, left him a gospel track. Then we had a guy call the office, I think it was on Thursday, and he said he wanted to talk to somebody about faith. Well, an hour and a half later, uh, I got off the phone with him, had given him the gospel, he's agnostic, but even praise God that people will call the church wanting to know about faith. So uh, I'm going to pray before we open the word this morning. Again, continue to pray for Sue Sterling. Um, Sue, again, is um, not able to speak. Um, she is much more responsive than she was at this time last week. Uh, the family has some decisions they have to make, so please keep Sue in prayer. And then uh, last night, Bev Myers was in the hospital for 
some tests and everything. She had a tremendous amount of pain. Um, so keep Bev in prayer. They think most of that is arthritis in her spine, but uh, pray for some relief for pain. She did come home uh, early this morning, but keep Bev in prayer. So let's pray this morning for these requests. Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we have to be able to come and open the Word of God. Lord, I would certainly pray for Sue and Ned and the kids, Father, through this very difficult time they're going through. Thank you, though small, for the progress that's been made by Sue this week. And uh, certainly she's better now than she was earlier in the week, but still a long, long way to go. And so give grace and encouragement. We pray for Bev this morning that you might continue to give grace and encouragement to her and help her to be able to to deal with the pain that she's going through, Father. Uh, Lord, we uh, again, Father, would pray for Don. Thank you that he's here this morning. Continue to minister grace to him, Father, uh, during this time of phase passing. And uh, Lord, again, we just want to tell you this morning that we love you. Help us to be cognizant this week of opportunities that you might bring, bring across our path, whether it's in a restaurant, whether it's giving a pair of shoes, whether it's just witnessing that I'm back in church again, whatever those opportunities, Lord, help us to use them to share the gospel of Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Well, take your Bibles, turn them to the book of Revelation this morning, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Today we're going to be looking at the church of Pergama. I'm going to read this portion for us and then I have a question for you this morning. If you have a pew Bible, I believe it's on page 1914. 1914 in the Pew Bibles. It says, To the angel of the church in Pergama, write, These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give you some hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. May God bless the reading of his word. So here's my question today. If I was to ask you, what is a worldly church, what would you say? Now, I'm not going to ask you to come to tell me, but what, what goes through your mind when I say worldly church? What is a worldly church? Um, here's some of the answers that I was reading a bunch of articles this week about the church today and the worldly church and those type of things. And here is some of the answers uh, that they had to that question. Um, Worldly churches are where people wear jeans and not suits. Likewise, I wore a tie this morning, so I am not worldly. Pastor... You used to wear a suit. What happened? (laughs) Just like to give Pastor a hard time. But that's what they said. Um, Or 
if a church has organ, an organ and not drums. If a church has drums, it's definitely worldly. Another one was uh, women wear dresses in spiritual churches, but they wear pants in worldly churches. Bunch of wicked women. <laughs> no, if a church has n- no lighting, now I'm not talking about this type of lighting, I'm talking about, you know, flashing lights and uh, things like that, it's considered worldly. It's considered worldly if it sings contemporary music. It's not worldly if it sings hymns. It's worldly if it looks, if it doesn't look like a church building. It's worldly if it doesn't. So we think about all those things, they are all what? Outward. They are all outward. When I was, I think, probably in 10th and 11th and 12th grade, at least 10th and 11th, every Sunday afternoon, there was about 20 of us, teenagers and uh, some college-age guys that would get together at 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Right next to our church, there were quite a few fields, and we would play football from, you know, whatever time, 1.30 to 3.30, and uh, choir was at 4.30, so everybody would go home and get changed and go back to choir. But uh, at that time, my dad was on the deacon board, and he was the head of the deacon board, so he would get calls about everything. And uh, I remember one evening, he got a call from somebody in the church to talk about the worldly teenagers that were playing football on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, horrible, huh? But that was considered what? Worldly. It was considered worldly. So it's amazing what we consider worldly. Let me, let me read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses, uh, or 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Paul's writing here, verses 1 to 5. He says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, um, fierce, despisers of those who are good, uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, proudful, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power of, for such, turn away. And at first glance, you would think, wow, Paul's writing to unsaved people, but no, Paul is writing to Christians. That, to me, is the definition of worldliness. That's the definition of worldliness, and you'll notice all those things are not outward. They're all dealing with what? The heart. They're all dealing with heart issues. And so this morning, we're going to, our third word in this series is worldly. Our first word was loveless. And then last week, we talked about faithful or faithfulness. And today, it is the word worldly. And this is the church at Pergama. And uh, again, we start off with who's writing to the church. And it says there in verse 12. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. And so right away, the correspondent, the one who is writing this letter, is Jesus Christ himself. We know in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it says, The word of God is a living, active, what? And sharper than any two-edged sword. And so... Christ is the one. In fact, when Christ returns, he's going to return with this two-edged sword when he comes to bring judgment at his second coming. And uh, so we know the writer is Christ himself, and he's writing to the church at the city of Pergama. And each week we've been giving you a little information about the city itself. Pergama was about 100 miles 
north of Ephesus. Remember last week we looked at Smyrna. So we have Ephesus 40 miles north. We have Smyrna. And about 60 miles north we have Pergamon. It was actually the capital of that area. It was not near the sea. It was about 20 miles east of the Aegean Sea. Uh, so it wasn't a port city. Um, it was also not a, uh, at the crossroads of travel either, but it was known as a beautiful city and, and the capital of Asia during this time. Um, so it was a, a city to see. And the, and the amazing thing about this city was its library. It had a library with over 200,000 uh, handwritten books. And uh, it, it, that library was amazing, so impressive that Mark Anthony later sent it to his lover, Qu Queen Cleopatra, in Egypt. Um, we also realized that that library uh, got into a fight with the Alexandrian Library. Uh, they were wanting the librarian to come and work for them. And so they were sort of working behind the scenes trying to get her to come work for them. And the king found out, or the, the king found out about it, the pharaoh found out about it, shut it off. And also not only that, but he shut off all the paper that they were sending from Alexandria up there for them to write on. So the Pergamon, Pergamon people had to come up with a different way, a different type of parchment, so they would begin to use animal skins to continue to build their library. And uh, some people even say, in fact, the word parchment may derive from a form of the word Pergamon. Uh, not only was Pergamon known for its library, but it was also known for it's uh, being the center of worship for many deities. Zeus, uh, Athena, uh, Dionysus, uh, but also was known for its worship of the empress of Rome. We learned a little bit about that because Smyrna was also. The church of Pergama, we don't know a whole lot about. Again, we really don't know when it started. We can speculate just like we did last week with Smyrna, that the church of Pergamum probably started when Paul was in Ephesus. And Paul probably took trips up to Smyrna and up to Pergamum and helped plant churches in that city. And so that's really uh, all we really know about that. Um, the book of Acts never talks about that church. So again, we speculate that the, it was Apostle Paul who started that church. So despite its difficult circumstances uh, in which it's found itself in, uh, the believers took strong stands. And uh, let's read again, starting with verse, verse 13. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city. And so God gives them some commendations. He says that they've kept their faith, that they've been faithful even in the midst of this difficult situation where it was considered the throne of Satan. Now, we, we should stop and talk about that a little bit because why was it considered the throne of Satan? And... Uh, some identify it with the magnificent temple of Zeus that they found in that city. It was one of the most magnificent temples in the city, and there were many temples. But because of the size of this temple, uh, they said it was the throne of Satan. Um, others have speculated that uh, another one of the Greek gods uh, who had a temple in the city who was the god of healing... Um, was also the throne of Satan because people would travel from all of the other Asian cities to this city and they would lay down in the courtyard of this huge uh, church-like facility and they would lay down and snakes would crawl across their bodies. And as the snakes crawled across their bodies, they would be healed. So, again... 
we have an idea of what the city was like in the worship. And even in the midst of this, uh, they stayed faithful. So another, another people say, another group of people say that it was Satan's throne was that of one of the temples of uh, worship that was to the emperor of Rome. So all kinds of speculation. We really don't know why, but it was uh, called the city of the throne of Satan. And the thing was, in the midst of that, in the midst of all those other worship that was going on in the city, there were those in the church of Pergama, as the word of God says, they held fast to the name of Christ and did not deny their faith. And then he talks about Antipas here. He says, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city. Antipas uh, evidently was part of the church there at Pergama, probably one of those who uh, helped to plant the church. Um, He was a man that took a strong stand for Christ. And by tradition, we're told that he was roasted to death inside of a brass bull during the time of persecution of one of the emperors of Rome. But he never gave up his faith. He stood strong for Jesus Christ. So, that was the commendation, but you'll notice there was a concern. And uh, he says in verse 14, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual idolatry. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So, here's what, in a sense, what they're picturing. It's like this side of the church here are faithful. Okay? This is the faithful. This part of the church right here You worship Baal, and this side of the church, you you worship the Nicolaitans. So, that's in a sense and a picture of what they're saying here. So, there were those in the church who were faithful, but there were two groups who were following heresies. And uh, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. And uh, the prophet... Baal, we find in the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verses 20, excuse me, Numbers 22 through uh, Numbers 25. And uh, fearful of Israel, uh, the Amorites, the Baalic king of Moab, hired uh, Balaam to curse the Israelites. And so on three different occasions, Balaam would come and curse the Israelites. But that didn't work. Israel, the Israelites did not turn from God. So since he was unable to curse them, he decided to corrupt them by teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. And so uh, they were told that it was okay to eat food that was offered to idols. They told it was okay to commit acts of immorality. You could serve God and you could serve idols at the same time. So this was the thing that Balaam began to preach. But really, before that could take foothold, God stepped in. God told Israel, listen, you can't do this. You cannot follow Balaam and his teaching, and uh, the Israelites turned back to God. So here in the New Testament, you have them following the same type of teaching. The teaching that said, listen, I can serve God, but at the same time, I can practice immorality. I can serve God, but I can also worship other gods. So that's what was the teaching of Balaam that was going on within the church of Pergamum. And then the New Testament Testament heresy was that of the Nicolaitans, uh, the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans started, I think I told you this a few weeks ago, in Jerusalem. Remember when God chose out seven deacons? One of those deacons turned to apostasy and began this movement of the Nicolaitans. 
And that movement of the Nicolaitans basically was the same type thing of Baal, that it was okay to worship God, but at the same time, you could practice immorality. Um, you could practice all kinds of forms of other worship um, besides that. Uh, so the, the, the Nicolaitans, they perverted the teaching of Christ and said that, listen, biblical teaching is good, but you can also practice all kinds of immorality. And they had all kinds of pagan orgies going on. So this is where they had gone a different direction. And so what's the command? Look at verse 16. What does God say for them to do? Repent, therefore. He's saying, listen, those who are following the Nicolaitans, those who are following Balaam, I want you to repent, and I want you to turn from your sin, and I want you to turn back to God. Otherwise, I will soon come to you. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And again, the sword representing the word of God that we find in Hebrews. He said, listen, I'm going to come and I'm going to use the word of God against you. I'm going to stand against what you're doing. And you know, the church should not tolerate sin. The church should not tolerate. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the church was tolerating sin. And Paul calls the church of Corinth out um, because they were sinning. They were allowing a man guilty of incest to continue in the church, and they weren't doing anything about it. And finally, Paul says, you need to deal with this man. He's continually sinning in the sin of incest, and you need to put him out. And finally, they did do that in, in Corinthians. So the church should always deal with sin. We shouldn't deal with it lightly. We should deal with it. If we find someone who is continually living in sin, maybe living in adultery or whatever, then the church is called to deal with that. And in Matthew chapter 18, we see he gives us that process. But there's a lot of churches today that are simply fence straddling. They're serving God, but then yet they're serving other gods at the same time. And you know, fence straddling is not a comfortable position to be in. When I was growing up, we lived in a development of about 250 to 300 homes. And uh, one street over from us was what we called, at least all the kids who were like 10, 11, and 12 at this time, we called it the plank. And basically what it was, was the one street was lower by about 12 feet. And they had taken a whole about 20 homes, and they had built up cinder blocks. And then on the top of those cinder blocks, they had put a fence. And so as young kids, as boys, we used to like to walk the plank at night. So usually about 7 o'clock, we went, and we would start at the upper end, and we would uh, grab on, and you could put your feet just a little bit before the fence, and we would walk down the plank. And we would try to push each other off that, you know, 10 foot. So that's the natural thing to do, isn't it? So then you would have to help them back up. And, uh, but about the 10th house down, they had a German shepherd. And the guy loved, when he knew we were doing what we were not supposed to be doing, to let that dog out. And man, that dog would come out, roo, 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 and he'd be yelling and he'd be jumping up at us. And, you know, we would try to get by there quickly. And we would try to make sure he couldn't get us. On this one particular night, it seemed like he was jumping higher. And he was almost getting the back of our heels. And so we said, well, let's jump the fence. So we jumped the fence. I went to go over the fence, and I got stuck on the fence. <laughs> you know, being stuck on a fence is not a comfortable place to be, is it? <laughs> And I'm trying to get off and the dog, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to fall off into the yard, and I'm going to get bit by the dog, and I'm trying to go the other direction. And, and finally, after about what seemed like an eternity, it was like 30 seconds, I just sort of got off and ripped my whole pants. <laughs> but what I learned that night was straddling a fence is uncomfortable. 
But you know what? Listen, for us as Christians, straddling the fence ought to be uncomfortable. It ought to not be a place that's comfortable for us to be where we're serving the world and we're trying to serve Christ at the same time. And this is what this church was trying to do, the church of Pergamum. They were practicing, part of the church was doing what was right, but the other part was straddling the fence. They were trying to serve Christ and serve the world at the same time. It was a worldly church, at least part of it was. And so we as a church today need to be careful that we stand firm. I was listening to a message this week of a pastor who had just come to a brand new church. And uh, he said he was in an elders meeting. He said it was the second elders meeting he had been to. And one of the elders said, Pastor, I know we've already hired you, but I want to ask you a question. He said, do you lean to the right or do you lean to the left? He said, I thought about that question for about 10 seconds, and I looked at that man, and he said, I don't lean, sir, I stand. And I stand on the word of God and what it says. And I don't lean to the left, and I don't lean to the right, I stand. Wasn't really the answer that the elder was looking for, or the deacon, and so, listen, we need to be a church who stands on what God's Word says and preaches the Word of God. And then at the end of each of these letters to the churches, he gives them, in a sense, something for the future. And you'll notice in verse 17, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has the Spirit, say to the churches, to him... Who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. The, when we first started this, um, I told you that there's the past, the present, and the future. And so the past, of course, would be looking back at this church when they started. And that's when they're being written to. The present is these things are apropos for us today as the church of this generation to learn from. And then the third part is there's always a futuristic. There's always something that's looking ahead. So these last, the counsel that he gives this church is two parts, but this is looking ahead. This is when we're in heaven. This is when we're with Christ in heaven. So this is what we have to look forward to. And he says, there's two things here that you have to look forward. And he said, to him who overcomes, that's those who know Christ is their Savior, those who uh, will have been saved, I will give some of the hidden manna. Now, we know in the Old Testament, manna was sent down from heaven for the people to eat. But we know in the New Testament, when it talks about manna, it's talking about Christ himself. Christ is the living manna. And so someday... We're going to have this relationship with Christ like we've never had before. You ever struggle with your devotions? Are there ever those times in your life where you feel, man, I'm just not close to Christ? And, and there just feels like, whether it's sin in our life or something, that there's a separation. Well, what this is telling us is, listen, in eternity to come, when we're in heaven, we're going to have a relationship with Christ like we've never had before. Like we can't even begin to comprehend now. We've been talking about heaven on Wednesday mornings in our Bible study. And we've been talking about, oh, listen, when I get to heaven, you know, I, I've been married to Virginia for all these years. Am I going to know that she's my wife? I'm going to know, but I'm not going to care. <laughs> because here's the thing. Listen to me. That's not going to be my focus in heaven. Now, that might seem a little rough, but the reality of it is, listen, marriage is not what's important in heaven. Our relationship with Jesus, because in heaven we are, in a sense, what? We are the bride of Christ. 
We are the church who is now married to Jesus Christ. And that's all that's going to marry, or all that's going to really matter in heaven. And yes, I think we'll know that this was my spouse. I'll know these are my kids. But there'll be a whole different relationship in heaven. And it will be the greatest relationship that you have ever experienced with Jesus Christ. And that's what this verse is talking about. That hidden manna. That manna, I can't understand it. It's hidden to me right now. But someday it will be revealed, this relationship with Christ. And then he said, I will also give him a white stone with a new name. In biblical times, when they ran games, and we talked a little bit about the Bema seat, the judge would award the winners. And in heaven, we are winners. We're the victors. Uh, we've been saved through Jesus Christ. And we're going to receive a stone, and that stone will have a new name for us. Now, again, in biblical times, you would get a stone at the end of the competition, and that stone would get you into the evening banquet. And so when I went to the banquet after the games, I would show my stone, and that would get me in. And so in heaven, we're going to have a stone that's going to get us in to the great banquet in heaven, to the marriage feast in heaven, and we're going to have a new name. And when we go through Scripture, uh, we found... In Scripture, there were quite a few people who received new names, weren't there? There was Ab Abram, who became who? Abraham. There was Sarai, who became Sarah. There was Jacob, who became Israel. There was Simon, who became Peter. There was Saul, who became... And you know, here's the interesting thing about all those new names... All those new names represented a new beginning, a new hope, and a new blessing. When I get to heaven, it's going to be a brand new beginning. Brand new beginning. I'm going to have a, a, a hope I've never understood before. And I'm going to have blessings that I've never been able to experience. And so with that new name comes a new beginning, a new hope, a new blessing. And so that's what he's saying. Here in heaven, you're going to get a stone and you're going to get a brand new name. A brand new name. It says, only him who receives it will know it. Only you who receive it will know it. And that will be your ticket into the great banquet in heaven. So what do we have to look forward to? We have to look forward to a relationship with Jesus like we've never experienced in our life. We have to look forward to in heaven someday a new name and an invitation into the great banquet in heaven. And that's what this portion of Scripture teaches us. Let's pray. Father, help us to be like those in Pergamum who are faithful. Help us not to be worldly people or a worldly church. Help us to be known as a church that stands on the word of God and puts God's word first in our life. Help us to be a church that does not go to the right, does not go to the left. We don't lean either direction, Father. We stand on what God's word says. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus You can have all this world Just give me Thank you for being with us this morning. Make sure you take a few minutes to greet those around you. And uh, we look forward to worshiping again together next Sunday. But think about staying for Sunday school this morning. It starts in about 15 minutes and uh, have some great Sunday school classes going on. What are you studying? Kathy's not here. First John. First John. Okay. Downstairs, First John. Upstairs here, it's... What are you guys studying upstairs? I know Kathy was supposed to teach, but she's sick. What's that? Holy Habits. So Holy Habits, right next door, and downstairs, First John. So... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's because you're teaching this morning, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, stay for Sunday school. And the teens, teens, you're downstairs this morning, so you want to make sure you stay for your class also. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Jesus, give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus.